Okay, so one matrix decomposition that uh, most people are familiar with from their undergraduate days is uh, the symmetric eigen decomposition or sometimes known as the spectral decomposition. So that's where you take um, a symmetric, a real symmetric matrix A, and you decompose it essentially according to its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So uh, let's see how that works. What we say is we write A um, in the form U lambda U transpose, where U is an orthogonal matrix, and it's going to turn out that its columns are eigenvectors, but for now U is just an orthogonal matrix, and lambda is a diagonal matrix. And again, it's going to turn out that that diagonal matrix is a matrix of corresponding eigenvalues. So we, just by convention to make it unique, order those eigenvalues typically uh, from largest to smallest, um, and that is our eigen decomposition. So why is it an eigen decomposition? Well, you can see that quite easily just by um, post-multiplying both sides of that equation one there by u, and what you get then is that au is u lambda. And if you just think about that one column at a time, so you take the first column of u there with a corresponding eigenvalue, you can see that essentially each column is of the form a u i is lambda i u i. Okay, and that's exactly the equation you have for the eigenvalue and eigenvector of the matrix A. Okay, so that is the situation. So essentially, if you knew the eigenstructure, uh, so you knew all of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you could order them uh, by the eigenvalue uh, size, uh, stack them together, and that would make your matrix U. So that, that's how you should think about what this decomposition represents. It's really just the eigenstructure of your matrix A. Okay, but that is super useful because this matrix U uh, contains the eigenvectors, and because the matrix that you started off with is uh, symmetric, uh, it turns out that the eigenvectors will be orthogonal, and so this matrix U is an orthogonal matrix. So we've seen already that orthogonal matrices are very convenient, and so this is a, a nice convenient representation of a matrix A in terms of a diagonal matrix, which is very, very simple to work with, and an orthogonal matrix, which is also very, very simple to work with, and in particular, very easy to invert. Okay, so this is a really nice, powerful decomposition. Like I said, most people have seen this before in one form or another uh, from their, their undergraduate education. Um, it's super useful conceptually and mathematically, and it can be useful in practice as well. In fact, it's not used in practice as much as some of the other uh, decompositions that we're going to look at, but certainly uh, you need to understand this one, and it is still used uh, in practice for certain kinds of problems. It's still um, a, a very useful decomposition. Okay, so the first question is how do you compute uh, it? Um, well, again, if you learned about eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, earlier in your uh, education, um, you'll have done various ways of computing those, um, basically solving linear equations or whatever. Uh, that is not how um, you compute uh, the eigen decomposition. The details really don't matter from the point of view of this course, but essentially it's an iterative procedure that transforms the, uh, the matrix one at a time to gradually construct um, this decomposition, uh, which ultimately has the right properties. Okay, so the details don't matter. What you do need to know is that it's an order n cubed uh, computational procedure, uh, just like the Cholesky decomposition. However, um, it's a lot more costly than uh, a Cholesky decomposition. Okay, so although they're both order n cubed, um, the, the, the leading constants are, are different. And so a symmetric eigen decomposition, yeah, is ballpark. Uh, 10 times more costly than Cholesky, okay? So if you can get by with the Cholesky, uh, you don't want to waste time and effort uh, forming this uh, symmetric eigen decomposition. But the symmetric eigen decomposition, as we'll see, is a lot more powerful. There's a lot more you can do with it. Okay, so the first thing that you get from this decomposition is just a different way of thinking about um, uh, 
positive semi-definite matrices. Okay, so um, they're all going to be positive. Okay, so um, your eigenvalues are all going to be positive and you know, there's just this one-to-one -one correspondence, right? The correspondence goes both ways. So uh, a positive definite matrix is a matrix whose eigenvalues are all strictly positive, and a positive semi-definite matrix is a matrix whose eigenvalues are all uh, non-negative. Um, so that's that's useful, and and so we can think of this um, if we just flick back actually to the original decomposition equation one there. Um, Basically, you're just saying that you can think of A as a rotation, a stretch, and then rotating back again. Okay, And so really, uh, all a real symmetric matrix does is stretch space in a linear way uh, by different amounts in different directions, and, and that's what the eigenvalues tell you. But it's essentially just stretching space uh, in a linear way um, as long as you rotate your bases correctly. Okay, so that's what it means. Uh, why is it useful? Well, it's useful, um, well, for many reasons, but one is that it allows us to essentially uh, define what it means to apply a function to a matrix, a, a regular real-valued scalar function. Okay, so uh, first of all, you know, what does it mean to raise uh, a matrix to the power m? Well, that, that we already know, right? We just multiply a by itself m times. But if we think of it in terms of the spectral decomposition, we see that a different way of thinking of it is, um, if you read that equation right through to the end, is that you simply apply the power function uh, to the eigenvalues in the spectral decomposition. So you take each eigenvalue, you raise it to the power m, and then you kind of embed it in those rotations. So that's then a general strategy okay so clearly if you can do that you can do it for any power of a matrix so in fact you could do it for any polynomial or power series and so any function that can be represented as a power series there's a sort of natural way of extending that function so it applies to matrices and so effectively what it boils down to is you've got some scalar function um, f um, what you can do is you can define what it means to talk about that function being applied to a matrix simply by applying that function to the eigenvalues within the eigen decomposition. Okay, and so in particular, um, that allows us to define lots of uh, very useful functions. So one is the matrix exponential. Okay, so what the matrix exponential function is not is just applying the exponential function to each element of a matrix. Right, that turns out not to be a useful thing to define particularly. Uh, but what is a useful thing to define is this uh, notion of a matrix exponential, where you uh, apply the exponential function to um, the eigenvalues, essentially. Of uh, an eigen decomposition, and that is then consistent with like the power series representation as well. So again, you start with a power series representation for the exponential of a real value, and you replace that real value with a matrix. And again, it's exactly equivalent to this definition here. Okay, so matrix exponentials crop up uh, in lots of places, in particular uh, solving matrix differential equations, uh, which I don't think we're going to talk about in the context of this course. But it's a very useful notion and. Obviously, the, the corresponding inverse, the matrix logarithm, also crops up in lots of places. So that's a, a nice function that you can define this way, but it's not the only one. Um, so a particularly useful one in the context of statistics is uh, giving us directly the symmetric matrix square root. So we said that um, the Cholesky decomposition is a useful notion of square root for matrices, uh, but it's not the only one. Um, and in particular, it's not symmetric. And so you might want to know, well, if I've got a real symmetric matrix, um, maybe I can find a square root that is also a real symmetric matrix. And you can, and it's pretty easy to say, see that um, if you define square root of a matrix using this notion we've just uh, described, then what do we do? We apply the square root function to the eigenvalues, and then we you know, recompose with the rotations. And exactly what we get is this, um, is this matrix that it clearly is symmetric and clearly has the property that the square of it is the matrix that you started from. Okay, so if you ever need a symmetric square root, uh, this certainly gives you it. Uh, one advantage it has over the Cholesky factor is that um, 
it's perfectly well defined for positive semi-definite matrices so um, even if you've got some zero eigenvalues you can still square root those that isn't a problem uh, you know the square root of zero is zero so this works perfectly well for positive semi-definite matrices so if you've got a singular covariance matrix that you need to square root then this this uh, symmetric square root will work perfectly well whereas you you'd have some issues at least if you wanted to perform the Cholesky decomposition of a, a singular matrix all right, so, um, and also sometimes you just want it to be symmetric uh, for reasons we're not gonna get into, but occasionally you might actually want the, the symmetry of this matrix, that might be a useful property. Okay, so that's the uh, matrix square root. Um, another thing you can do with this notion of applying a function is you can apply the reciprocal function in order to get an inverse. Uh, so again, if we just invert the eigenvalues and, and recompose, then that gives us exactly a inverse. So this is a, a different way of thinking about the inverse of a matrix, uh, or if you like, it's a different way of constructing the inverse of a matrix. Uh, and again, that can be useful in, in certain situations. So as I've sort of hinted at a few times, you almost never really want to directly construct the inverse of a matrix actually in code. Um, but it's often, of course, useful to think about the inverse of a matrix and what that is and what it represents. And this is a, a nice way of thinking about that inverse and it can be useful in certain situations. Uh, notice that this clearly won't work for a singular matrix because um, singular matrices don't have inverses, but if you've got some zero eigenvalues, uh, you could just leave those alone. Yeah, so any non-zero um, eigenvalue, you uh, form its reciprocal, but any zero eigenvalue, you leave alone, and then you recompose with the rotation. So what does that represent? Well, that represents a kind of generalized or pseudo-inverse, and in fact, that particular one I've just described uh, is precisely the, the so-called Moore-Penn-Rose generalized inverse of a matrix, and that is useful in certain situations. So um, again, not so relevant in the context of this course, but that has some nice properties that you know give you, uh, in some sense, optimal solutions to certain classes of problems that are not uniquely defined. Okay. So that's inversion. So we can use it to invert matrices as well. Um, this also gives us a nice way of thinking about um, what happens when a matrix is close to singular as opposed to exactly singular. Um, so let's, let's think about that problem now. So suppose that we're essentially trying to solve a linear system involving A. So we're trying to solve the uh, system AX equals Y for given A and Y and unknown X. Yeah, we want to solve for X. Um, but we're doing this in the case where maybe um, A is exactly rank deficient. So there are some zero eigenvalues. Or maybe we're also thinking about the case when um, it's not exactly rank deficient, but um, there are some very, very small eigenvalues. Okay, so uh, we, we know the solution, right? We, we just multiply both sides by A inverse, uh, but we know an expression for A inverse now in terms of our spectral decomposition, so we can substitute that in. And that gives us a nice way of thinking about this inversion process. So what we do is we rotate coordinates, uh, we rescale, by dividing through by the eigenvalues, and then we rotate back again. Okay, so that's uh, that's what we're doing when we invert a matrix. Uh, and clearly, um, if one of your or one or more of your eigenvalues are zero, uh, then you can't divide through by that eigenvalue. That's not something that you can do. Um, so that um, you know is another way of thinking about the fact that you can't invert a matrix. But what if it's not exactly zero? What if it's just a tiny number? Then what? Clearly, that's going to blow up that value. And that is precisely the problem with the, the so-called ill-conditioned matrices, that effectively you end up dividing by a very tiny number, and that causes something that shouldn't be blown up huge to be blown up huge. So let, let's see what happens. So... Um, Suppose we're in the, the simple sort of n by n symmetric case. Um, it's got a bunch of eigenvalues of sort of sensible values, uh, but then it also has its final eigenvalue that isn't exactly zero, but it's actually very tiny. And so we're gonna call that uh, epsilon. Um, 
and we want to do some computations with A, and in particular, we want to solve a linear system. Now, we're doing this on a computer, uh, and computers have finite precision, so we're going to see the effect of that finite precision on these computations as well. All right. So we're doing computations on a computer, and suppose the computer that can only do um, computations essentially up to, to order epsilon, that is an accuracy of one, port, one part in, uh, in one over epsilon. Um, what, what are the, what's the impact of the fact that the precision of your calculations, your floating point operations, is of a similar order of magnitude to your smallest eigenvalue? Yeah. So the question is, um, how does the interaction between those two uh, issues uh, play out and and what we'll see is it plays out in a very bad way. So uh, we're trying to solve the system uh, AX equals something and so let's let's just for simplicity consider the case where the the right hand side is just the dominant eigenvector okay the the first eigenvector because then we know what the answer is right the answer is clearly uh, X is just you want the first eigenvector, right? So we know mathematically the, the answer here, but imagine now we're computing it on a computer. Um, so we know that what do we do? We rotate U1, we uh, divide through by the eigenvalues and rotate back again. But, but what really happens when we do that? So when we rotate, we're rotating basically to the basis of uh, eigenvectors. So we just get the first unit vector, right? So that's exactly what that first rotation does. Um, so we've now got the first unit vector. Um, however, because we're doing this computationally, we're not going to get precisely that first unit vector. We're going to get that first unit vector perturbed by a tiny bit of noise. And so each element could be perturbed by a tiny bit of, of, of error. Um, and, and we don't know what that error is going to be necessarily, but um, we know that it's going to be roughly of the order uh, plus or minus epsilon. So just, again, just to keep everything simple, just suppose, for example, that that final entry EN was actually precisely epsilon, right? It doesn't matter, you know, but it could have been, right? There's no reason why it couldn't have been. So just to keep things simple, suppose that it was, okay? Well, now um, we know that when we divide through, we're going to get roughly one for the first term. We're gonna get roughly zero for the other terms, but then that final term, we're going to have epsilon divided by epsilon, and so that final term is going to be of order one, yeah? So instead of getting the first unit vector that we're supposed to get, we've actually got the first unit vector plus the last unit vector. Uh, and so of course then when we rotate back again, instead of getting u1, we're going to get u1 plus un. Yeah, and and so obviously we picked all of the the, the coefficients and numbers here to um, to make everything work out very simply. But the more general case would be that essentially um, the the eigenvector corresponding to the tiny eigenvalue is going to get uh, mashed in to lots of other things that it shouldn't get mashed into okay so um it, it's just going to be horrible yeah so if the if you've got eigenvalues that are of a similar order of magnitude to the precision that your computations are working at then all of your uh all of your results are going to get affected by this uh this spurious eigenvector getting thrown in uh to to all of your other results um yeah, so you can work this through for other eigenvectors and linear combinations of eigenvectors, and you see the same thing happening. This this UN is going to end up some some combination, some weighting of that UN is going to end up getting uh, uh, mixed in with your results that you really know should be there. Okay, so this is what happens, right? So it's it's very bad. Okay, so I think I'm just saying more or less the same thing here that any. Any vector can obviously be written as a linear combination of the eigenvectors. And so you can think about then how that plays through. But basically, um, all of the components of your results get, get messed up if you're solving a linear system involving this matrix A. Okay, so what what is the take-home message for this? Well, again, when you work it all through and think about it carefully, so here we assume that the biggest eigenvalue is 1. Um, in general, the problem that you encounter 
ends up depending on the ratio of the biggest eigenvalue in magnitude and the smallest eigenvalue in magnitude. So here it was one and an epsilon, uh, but in general, it would be the largest eigenvalue uh, relative to the smallest eigenvalue in magnitude. Yeah, so remember, in, in general, we could have negative eigenvalues, but uh, in magnitude, the largest to the smallest is um, what's known as the condition number of the matrix. So this condition number is essentially a measure of how bad things are. Yeah, so we'd like to see nice small condition numbers like one, ideally, or, or numbers close to one. If we see a very big condition number, it tells us that there's a very big difference between the biggest and smallest eigenvalues, and we should be starting to worry about these sorts of problems we've talked about happening once that uh, condition number gets up to, you know, numbers of the order of the reciprocal of the precision uh, that your floating point operations are happening at. Okay. Um, and it's such an important number. It's got a name. It, it, it's not just kappa by coincidence. There, it's often known as kappa, and there is a kappa function in R that will approximate this for you. So, um, so just be aware there is this notion of condition number, and it tells you how bad uh, computations involving that matrix are likely to be from a numerics perspective. Okay, and so orthogonal matrices um, all have uh, eigenvalues uh, one, or in, in at least in magnitude, and so um, so kappa is one, right? And that's exactly why they're so nice, uh, or it's one reason why they're so nice from a numerical perspective. Yeah, they have a very good condition number, and so you know you don't have these sorts of problems. Now, of course, as we've discussed. You know, you can easily invert an orthogonal matrix by transposing it anyway, but um, they, they have good numerical properties. Right, so can we use this to understand that uh, linear regression example we looked at previously? Yeah, so we, we had this linear regression with a simple quadratic model where um, it all went horribly wrong. So why did it go horribly wrong? Well, it turns out it went horribly wrong because we constructed X so that it had a, a high condition number. That is, the X involved um, is said to be ill-conditioned. So can we figure it out? Uh, yes, we can. So let's think about what, what do we do when we were solving those uh, normal equations? We were effectively inverting X transpose X, and, and that was the problem because X transpose X has a very bad condition number. So, so how do we work that out? Well, let's work it out. Um, we um, just construct the model matrix X. We form X transpose X here using the cross prod function, which is a, a good trick worth knowing about. It's a little bit cheaper than forming it directly with matrix multiplication. Um, we do the symmetric eigen decomposition and just pull out the eigenvalues and then look at the ratio of the biggest to smallest. Here we know that they're all non-negative at least, so we can just look at the ratio of the, the biggest to smallest and um, it's huge, right? It's order 10 to the 18. So that's the problem, right? That this matrix X that we constructed had a huge condition number. So, um, yeah, there, there are lots of questions here. So um, could we have um, figured this out directly just by looking at X without actually directly forming X transpose X? And we'll see in a second. Yes, we can. So we, we can actually figure out condition numbers associated with rectangular matrices, for example. That's something we can do. Um, but the other interesting question then that arises is, but actually when we used LM to solve this problem, at least the first version of this problem, uh, it worked fine. And so how did LM avoid this problem? Well, it avoids the problem, in fact, by never forming X transpose X, but we'll get back to that uh, in a little while. So the, there are simple things you can do in order to improve conditioning. So in the, in the context of that regression problem, there are lots of things you could do, right? You could scale your variables, you could use orthogonal polynomials, right? There are all kinds of things you can do. But if you've just got a generic matrix operation that you're worried about, uh, you're worried that you need to solve a linear system involving an, an ill-conditioned matrix, and you, know, you can't go back and completely reformulate the problem, is there a simple trick you can do to make the problem a little 
little, a little bit better conditioned. And uh, yes, there is, and that's a trick known as preconditioning, um, which again is a generic trick that crops up in lots of contexts. But here we'll just see how um, it can help us solve this uh, this problem of a matrix being very poorly conditioned. So. Um, yeah, so if we've got a diagonal matrix, then the condition number doesn't directly come into things, right? We can solve the equation dy equal to x, um, so long as we can do the computations, right? So long as, you know, the, the numbers are not so insane that, that things go horribly wrong straight away we can solve that diagonal system you don't have that problem that we that we've just looked at where you know one eigen um, vector kind of gets mixed into other eigenvectors because everything here is diagonal everything's independent so these operations are not interfering with one another so we can do this operation generally speaking irrespective of um, the condition number of D right so we can solve that system directly um, and the condition number doesn't really matter. And so what we can do, given an arbitrary x, is use a diagonal rescaling to take out some of that condition number from x, put it into d, uh, we make x better conditioned, and then we can solve things involving d separately, and the condition number that we've kind of taken out of x and put into d is not going to mess up the uh, the numerics right that's the intuition behind it so let, let's just see how it works in practice so we're going to do diagonal preconditioning of x transpose x here so we know that x transpose x is hard to invert because it's badly conditioned uh, so we don't get an inverse if we just try and directly compute it um, but now we're going to create a diagonal matrix to rescale x and we're going to construct D in, in this way here, where we take the diagonal elements of X transpose X and take one over the square root of them and use those to rescale the rows and the columns. So if this is not looking very familiar, it should. Uh, this is exactly what you do when you rescale a covariance matrix to turn it into a correlation matrix. Yeah, you rescale the rows and the columns in exactly this way. So if we look at this uh, expression here, the X transpose X, it's clear that if you look at the, the left hand side and the, if you simplify the right hand side, you're going to get the left hand side. OK, so it's, it's clear that this is a true statement. But what we've done is we've said we're going to take X transpose X. We're going to rescale it using D. And this rescaling, so this first D row rescales the rows, this last D rescales the columns. And what we're going to end up with now is a matrix that is not only real and symmetric, it's going to be real and symmetric and its diagonal is going to be one. Yeah. So just like a correlation matrix, it's just exactly the operation you do to take a, co a covariance matrix and turn it into a correlation matrix. So this matrix here that you now need to invert is, um, it turns out, better conditioned than the matrix that you started with because you've sort of you've taken the the diagonal aspect of the the condition number out of the problem yeah so it's clear that the ratio of the first and last diagonal entries is now one but that doesn't tell you that the uh, the ratio of the first and last eigenvalues is going to be one obviously but um it's taken out that that kind of dominant diagonal component of the condition number away from the problem so hopefully this matrix is going to be much better conditioned. We can then invert it and then we can, you know, rescale the rows and columns to put um, the original scaling back in. OK, and we've just said that we, we can do that very easily because messing with uh, these diagonal matrices is, is not really a problem. OK, so we can just see that. So if we if we do this rescaling, um, the, the exact theory for why this often works is, is a bit messy, but um, you can sort of intuitively see that it's it's likely to help at least. Uh, and so if we if we just take this matrix um, X transpose X, scale it according to D. Uh, and look at its eigenvalues, look at their ratios, we get this condition number. It's still a pretty horrible condition number, right? So there's no um, sense that this has you know, magically solved the problem and, or giving you a matrix with a condition number of one or anything like that. Uh, it's just helped take out 
uh, some of that ill conditioning. But now that is a small enough condition number that we can invert the matrix. Okay, So we now can solve that and, and what we should do is just solve it for the right hand side D there and then pre-multiply by the other D. Um, and we get an answer. Now we've seen again examples of computations that um, sort of don't fail, don't give an error, but in fact give the incorrect result. So we might be a little bit concerned here that we've got an answer at this point. It hasn't thrown an error, uh, but we still might be worried about whether the answer is correct or not. So we've constructed this thing that we hope is approximately an inverse for X transpose X, but we should probably check that it is or at least approximately, well, we do that just by multiplying it by our original X transpose X and see if we get the identity. Well, when we do that, we don't get exactly the identity, uh, but we get something that's pretty close. Yeah, those diagonal elements are not too far from one, and those off-diagonal elements, well, some are bigger or smaller than others. You might be particularly worried about um, this uh, this uh, off diagonal entry here that is supposed to be zero, but it's actually minus 0.35. So, you know, it's not like this um, This has been total magic or anything, but it's, it's, it's a reasonable uh, uh, approximation of, of the correct answer. So it's definitely better than not doing anything at all. Okay, so that's preconditioning. So that, that is a general trick that crops up in lots of different contexts. It's worth knowing about. But so far, everything we've talked about uh, with the eigen decomposition has started from the assumption that the matrix we're working with is real and symmetric, right? There are all kinds of nice things that follow from that uh, original matrix being real and symmetric. Um, and in particular, the, the fact that, you know, the the eigen vectors are orthogonal, for example, right, is, is a really important uh, property. Uh, that isn't true in general for, for any matrix, right? It's not always the case that all eigen vectors are orthogonal, right? That, that certainly isn't the case. So if you start with an asymmetric matrix, you're certainly not guaranteed that. Um, and, and there are other problems as well. And so if your matrix, yeah, so if, if you think of positive definite matrices as being like positive real numbers, um, then symmetric matrices are just like real numbers. Um, and so asymmetric matrices then are like complex numbers. Um, and this, ana this, this, this analogy isn't perfect, but um, it's interesting in that the asymmetric matrices, you often end up with complex eigen values and then vectors. Yeah, so if you imagine solving these problems by hand, you end up with uh, polynomials without real roots. And so the roots are then complex and you then obviously are gonna wind up with associated complex eigenvectors as well. So you, again, you've probably solved these problems by hand at undergraduate level. And so you know that this can happen, yeah? So this problem never happens if you start from a real symmetric matrix, right? You're, you're guaranteed to get all real eigenvalues and eigenvectors and for those eigenvectors to be orthogonal, right? So there, that's a really nice situation to be in. But in the general case, you just start with an asymmetric matrix, uh, even if it's square, um, none of these things are true. And so if you do an eigen decomposition of an arbitrary matrix, then it will have complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So you can still do this arc and cope with complex numbers. It's not like it's um, impossible to do. Um, but it turns out that in most cases, um, people don't work with uh, arbitrary complex eigen decompositions in statistical computing. And uh, people make jokes that it's just that statisticians are, are frightened of complex numbers and that there may be some truth in that, to be fair. But uh, I think it's more that there's just a more appropriate decomposition. So we've already seen, there isn't just one decomposition. We've already seen the Cholesky and the, and the eigen decomposition. And we've talked a little bit about the pros and cons. We're going to look at a, a couple more decompositions. So I don't think it's that um, necessarily, it's just that statisticians are, are frightened of uh, asymmetric eigen decompositions. It's just that there are better decompositions in the case of arbitrary asymmetric matrices. And in fact, in most cases, a much better uh, decomposition would be the singular value decomposition, which would avoid all of these issues and would generally uh, be cheaper and more stable and, you know, just better 
for most problems. Okay, so you could go down the route of forming an asymmetric eigen decomposition, but in most cases where you have a problem where you'd be tempted to do that, probably you should stop and think, is there another decomposition I could use? And in many cases, the answer will be uh, yes, you should use the singular value decomposition. Okay, so what is the singular value decomposition? Well, it's very much like the eigen decomposition. Um, uh, and in particular, it, it's very closely related to the eigen decomposition of A transpose A. Now, there are a few things to, to say about it before you know we even get into it at all. So you can do the... Um, the singular value decomposition for a square matrix A, and, and, and then it looks very much like uh, the eigen decomposition. But the nice thing, or one of many nice things about the singular value decomposition is you can apply it to an arbitrary uh, R by C matrix. So here we, we're concentrating on the case where you've got more rows than columns. So again, we're thinking about the statistical context where you'd have your data in a matrix and you'd have more observations than variables, right? So that's the typical uh, idea to have in your head that this matrix A is, is somehow some kind of matrix of data that you, you were interested in. Okay, so the so-called singular values are the positive square roots of the eigenvalues of A transpose A. And so it's immediately clear then if you've got a positive semi-definite matrix, then uh, the singular values correspond exactly to the eigenvalues. And in fact, for symmetric matrices more generally, the eigenvalues uh, and singular values can only differ in sign, right? So your singular values are by definition non-negative. Uh, we know that in general, um, you could get negative eigenvalues, but they differ only in sign. Okay, um, but that definition clearly works for any matrix A, uh, irrespective of whether it's square or symmetric or anything, because whatever A is, when you form A transpose A, that definitely is a square symmetric matrix, and so it does have uh, an eigen decomposition. Okay, so the singular values defined in this way uh, exist for any uh, real matrix A. Uh, and so that is one attractive notion. So these singular values act very like eigenvalues. Um, they're just a generalization, uh, and in particular, a generalization to these asymmetric cases and uh, non-square cases. Okay, so you can associate then um, with this notion of singular value, uh, a matrix decomposition. Again, very much analogous to the eigen decomposition. So the singular value decomposition says A is U, D, V transpose. So again, if we start by thinking about a square matrix A, just, just to start off with, then your matrices U and V are going to be orthogonal matrices, and D is going to be diagonal, right? That's going to be the, matri the diagonal matrix of singular values. So it looks almost exactly like the eigen decomposition except in the symmetric eigen decomposition, the two orthogonal matrices on the left and right were the same matrix. The only difference here is that the two uh, orthogonal matrices don't have to be the same. So in the case of a, a real symmetric matrix, they, they will be the same, and this will be exactly the same as the eigen decomposition, right? That, that, that's clear. Uh, but in general, if A is not symmetric, then you still get the decomposition of this form, uh, it still always exists, um, but your two orthogonal matrices now are different, so that you rot your rotation one way and your rotation back again are not exactly the same. That's all. Okay. So this is a, a really nice decomposition. Uh, it has amazing kind of applications all over statistics, uh, so it's really worth understanding it properly. Right. So this is what people typically use these days for many problems in preference to the the symmetric eigen decomposition. Um, so how does it work? Well, we've just explained how it works for uh, a square matrix, but let's make sure we understand it for a non-square matrix first of all. So for a non-square matrix, so we're thinking about A, as we said, as being tall and thin, right? Thinking of it being a data matrix, uh, tall and thin. In that case, U is also tall and thin. It has the same dimensions as A. Uh, D is um, 
a square diagonal matrix um, whose dimensions match as the number of columns of A, and V is a square orthogonal matrix, right? So V is an orthogonal matrix, but U is now a matrix with orthonormal columns, not an orthogonal matrix because uh, it's it's not square, right? So so it couldn't be. So let, let let's make sure we understand that. So what I'm saying is that if A is a tall thin matrix. then U has to be the same dimensions. D is going to be a little diagonal matrix, which you can write like that. And V or V transpose, whatever, oops, is gonna be an orthogonal matrix. Okay, we call that O. Okay, so that's our decomposition. Um, what's worth emphasizing here, okay, so that U is going to orthonormal columns so that means that u transpose u is going to be the identity but u u transpose is not going to be the identity u u transpose is going to be this huge m by n matrix that's very rank deficient right so it absolutely couldn't be the identity yeah so that's a slight complication but it turns out not to be a, a huge problem in practice uh, because v is an orthogonal matrix and so you can use that for cancellation okay but another thing worth knowing is that in fact there's there are two ways of uh, forming these singular value decompositions. So this de decomposition we've described here is sometimes known as the reduced uh, decomposition or sometimes even the thin decomposition. Um, there is a corresponding sort of full decomposition that you can sometimes get uh, out of libraries or sometimes it will be defined this way in the literature uh, so it's worth understanding the difference and the relationship between the two so there is an alternative way of taking our uh, matrix and decomposing it which is that you decompose it using a proper orthogonal matrix u okay that's square so that's huge right so this is why we don't like it because this is a huge orthogonal matrix we then need to have a kind of a diagonal matrix that's not square. So the only non-zero elements are on that, along that top diagonal there. And then we can have a little uh, orthogonal V just the same. V or V transpose doesn't matter. So we can e equivalently decompose it like this. As I say, this is called the full uh, singular value decomposition. Uh, how does it relate to the, the thin one we've just described above or reduced one? Well, you see that all of these, um, we've got zeros here in the bottom of this matrix, which tells you that um, if we just partition this orthogonal matrix here, all of these columns are gonna get zeroed out, so we don't need them, uh, and we don't need those rows either, and so we end up back at this, this reduced rank decomposition. So in statistical applications, you always want, or nearly always want, this uh, so-called reduced uh, decomposition, um, but just to be aware that some literature and some libraries will allow you to uh, extract this full decomposition. Okay, so you you know you might want that for some reason, right? You really might want both U and V to be orthogonal in some cases, for example. So there could be uh, situations where you really want this full decomposition, but in almost all statistical applications, we're thinking about having a lot of rows and not many columns. And so we really want to avoid constructing an n by n matrix at all, right? We don't want to see any n by n matrices ever. Uh, and so this reduced uh, decomposition gives us that reduced dimension uh, problem. Oops. Okay, so I hope that's clear. But anyway, so in, in our statistical uh, context, we're thinking about this reduced decomposition where U has orthogonal columns, but is of the same dimension as A. Okay, so um, yeah, it's all a lot of these decompositions are, are computed in, in similar ways and we, we, we don't have time to get into it in this course. Um, but um, yeah, again, it's an iterative procedure um, and Obviously here, it doesn't only apply to square matrices, so it doesn't necessarily make sense to say, is it an N cubed operation? But, you know, it is an N cubed operation. Uh, but here we could call it an RC squared uh, operation. Yeah, uh, so yeah, you don't form it by, you know, doing a symmetric eigen decomposition of A transpose A. 
Uh, in principle, you could, right? So you could form A transpose A, you could do a symmetric eigen decomposition and then use that to construct the singular value decomposition. That's one way of kind of showing the existence of the singular value decomposition. Um, but that's, that's not how it's done. However, it is a bit more costly than a symmetric eigen decomposition, right? So if you really care about flops and your problem can be solved with a, either a singular value decomposition or a symmetric eigen decomposition, um, actually the symmetric eigen decomposition is a bit quicker and that might be one reason for you using it. Um, but in most cases, um, the additional flexibility of the singular value decomposition uh, is, is attractive um, and, and it can simplify a, a lot of computation. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's more flexible than the symmetric uh, eigen decomposition. Yeah, and so here's some example timings. And of course, as, as we've said, um, you know, don't take the system time results uh, to be, you know, too seriously. Um, you know, do your own benchmarkings on your own hardware to see, see how they work. But roughly speaking, the Cholesky decomposition is very fast. A symmetric eigen decomposition is the next fastest. Then uh, the singular value decomposition will be a bit slower than the symmetric eigen decomposition. Uh, an asymmetric eigen decomposition will be much slower as well as more complicated and full of complex numbers. So we generally avoid that one. And then there's also the, the QR factorization that we'll, we'll look at next, which is also uh, faster than uh, a singular value decomposition. Okay, so we'll, we'll see uh, the QR decomposition in a little while. Okay, so the real definition of condition number is then the ratio of the largest to smallest singular values. Yeah, so that that in, in that's clearly equivalent to the definition definition we gave previously for a. Uh, square symmetric matrix but of course this definition now applies to any matrix so now for any matrix square symmetric rectangular whatever um, it doesn't matter we can define a condition number kappa and that that is still a, a useful concept for understanding how well behaved or otherwise a matrix is from a point of view of doing numerics so again if we come back to our um, regression example um, we can just directly form the singular values of X, okay, which is clearly not a square matrix, uh, let alone symmetric, but we can just directly uh, get the singular values of X and then look at the ratio of the smallest to largest. And we get this value here that's, you know, order 10 to the 9. Um, it's like very very easy to see that the uh, the condition number of x transpose x must be the square you just shove in the um the singular value decomposition right so you've got your udv transpose where you take the transpose of that times the other one and um you you just get a d squared in the middle and it's absolutely clear that the condition number of x transpose x is the square exactly the square of the condition number of x okay and so that's why it was roughly 10 to the 18 before yeah so x has a much smaller uh condition number than x transpose x and and this is generally a problem right so whatever your condition number of x is you're going to square that condition number by forming x transpose x so x transpose x is always much less well conditioned than X. And so ideally you wouldn't ever form X transpose X. And in fact, in most statistical applications, you can get away with ever, without ever forming X transpose X, yeah? So it's not just inverting that, that is a nasty operation that you should always try and avoid. Actually, just forming X transpose X is a nasty operation that you should always try and avoid. And various decompositions allow you to avoid it, okay? And so we'll, we'll see how, um, We'll see how that works here, okay? So if we go back to our normal equations then, the, the thing we wanted were the um, regression coefficients and we know that they're given in principle by X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. But if we just substitute in now for our singular value decomposition of X and just start simplifying, okay? So the, the way you can simplify is using the fact that um, 
U transpose U is the identity. Remember we said that U U transpose isn't necessarily, but U transpose U is. Uh, and V is an orthogonal matrix. So V, V transpose, V transpose, V, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're both the identity. So if we just start um, simplifying that expression, we very quickly get down to this expression at the bottom here which is an awful lot simpler than the thing that we started with. So what do we do? We take our y vector, we rotate it with u, uh, we rescale with d, and we rotate it then with v. Okay, so that's a really nice operation. And in some sense, the, the condition number here is exactly the condition number of x. Yeah, so d is basically telling you the condition number of x. And the condition number of this entire operation is the condition number of x. It's not the condition of x transpose x. Yeah, it's the square root of that. So this is just a much better condition problem. Uh, but also, because we're computing everything directly from the singular value decomposition, these are all very, very simple operations to apply. Yeah, it's just a rotation, which is nice, a rescaling, which is nice, even if the condition number isn't one, you know, that's still not a terrible operation usually. And then another rotation, which is nice. Okay, so this is a really nice numerically stable way to solve the um, the normal equations. So this would give us a solution to that regression problem. It's not actually the solution that LM uses. We'll look at that in a second. But this would be a, a very, you know, reasonable and straightforward way to get a reasonably efficient and numerically stable solution to those least squares equations. Okay, it's a perfectly good way of solving it. Um, and yeah, and, and so this is sort of telling us that that this this matrix here, V, D inverse, U transpose, is some sort of pseudo inverse for X. I mean, we're not really going to explore that in detail, but, that, you know, that's just something to have in the back of your mind. So the singular value decomposition has loads of applications, and it's often applications like this where um, you you want to get some nice way of getting your getting a, a handle on the the interesting directions in a problem uh, and so here we can just start from our singular value decomposition and we can say okay well those singular values that are quite big we're interested in and those that are quite small then we're not so interested in so we just zero those out and see what happens right and that's a reduced rank approximation and so that can uh just get rid of noise from a problem, get rid of numerical error, um, statistical error. You know, there are all kinds of uh, reasons why you want, might want some low rank approximation to a matrix. Uh, it might, you know, simplify some some other computations you want to do. It might get rid of noise. Uh, PCA is based on this idea, right? So principal components analysis, you look at the dominant directions and you ignore all of the others, right? Uh, you can do PCA directly using the singular value decomposition of X as opposed to the kind of classical way that um, principal components analysis is often taught where you start from the covariance matrix and you do a symmetric eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix right so what we see here is that actually you can do everything directly from the singular value decomposition of x you don't ever need to form x transpose x which as we've discussed is a not nice operation and we certainly don't then have to do the the eigen decomposition of that we can just directly work with the singular value decomposition of x and that tells us everything we need to know straight away about the eigen decomposition of x transpose x so it crops up a lot in multivariate statistics uh, and, and all over the place, right? It's just a generally very useful decomposition. Right, so the singular value decomposition can be used to solve, you know, many, many um, matrix computation problems. Um, and in particular, it can be used to solve least squares problems, as we've just seen. However, it turns out that there's another related decomposition called the QR decomposition, which is cheaper than the singular value decomposition, uh, but also very stable. Um, and because it's a bit cheaper um, than the SVD, it, it's quite attractive if it solves the problem that you're interested in. Now, it doesn't solve as many problems as a singular value decomposition does, but it does solve least squares problems, right? So this is actually the strategy that LM uses to solve least squares problems. It uses the QR decomposition. So let's have a look at the QR decomposition. Let's look at what it is and why it's useful, and in particular, why it solves least squares problems. <laughs> 
So again, just like the QR, uh, sorry, just like the SVD, um, it applies to arbitrary shaped matrices X, right? They don't have to be symmetric. They don't even have to be square. If you think about first the square case, okay, the square, if, if X was square, then you just get uh, X as being um, an orthogonal matrix Q times an upper triangular matrix R. Okay, so that would be in the square case. In the non-square case, um, again, there are the two variants. So the the variant that we're nearly always interested in is the thin or reduced variant, where we write our tall thin matrix X as being a tall thin matrix Q, which has orthogonal columns, and then an upper triangular matrix uh, R. There is another variant of it where you get a full orthogonal matrix Q, and then you have to be a bit clever with your matrix R, but basically it's upper triangular in that sense. So it's a tall, thin matrix, uh, but it's upper triangular in the sense that only those uh, elements exist. So if you really want uh, an orthogonal matrix Q, then this, this will be the way to go. But again, in most statistical applications, we absolutely don't want an N by N matrix if we can possibly avoid it. So we have the same thing that all of these things are zero here anyway. And so it doesn't really matter what any of these columns are. They're all going to get zeroed out anyway. And so that gets us back to our reduced decomposition. Okay. So in statistical applications, again, we nearly always want this reduced decomposition. Um, which, um, yeah, where Q has orthogonal columns, um, but is not an orthogonal matrix. Yeah, so again, Q transpose Q is the identity, but Q Q transpose is not. So again, it has a cost of R C squared, just like the singular value decomposition. But um, in this case, um, it's roughly... It depends on the implementation, etc. But it roughly think a third of the cost of a, an SVD, right? So that could be, you know, a significant saving if you were doing this a lot of times. Right. So why is it useful? Well, again, it's useful because we've got an auth kind of an orthogonal matrix, or at least a matrix with orthogonal columns. We've seen before they can be very useful because they're very stable things. And we've got a triangular matrix. So again, we've already seen how triangular matrices are very, very convenient and how solving linear systems involving triangular matrices is very, very convenient. Uh, they're almost as convenient as diagonal matrices. Not quite. It's obviously easier to invert a diagonal matrix, but solving linear systems involving triangular matrices is very, very simple, uh, very convenient. And so it's almost as good as having a diagonal matrix. Okay, so uh, this seems like a good strategy. Uh, how is it formed? It's formed in a similar way to the other um, decompositions we've talked about. Um, but there is a, a nice way of thinking about this, which is um, if you've done any linear algebra, you might have done the Gram-Schmidt process for ortho orthonormalizing a basis. Yeah, So you're given an arbitrary basis and you have to turn it into an orthonormal basis. Right? So how do you do that? Well, you rescale your first basis vector so it has a length of one. Then you rescale your second vector uh, well, you then change your second vector by subtracting off the projection onto the first and then rescale it so it has length one, etc., etc., etc. That's the Gram-Schmidt procedure. What this um, what this QR factorization describes is exactly that Gram-Schmidt procedure, where you start off with the columns of x as being uh, your basis for some subspace, uh, and then what you end up with is a set of orthonormal columns. Okay. And so that's the result of doing the Gram-Schmidt procedure. And if you think about that Gram-Schmidt procedure, um, your column operations are always such that you're only acting on previously messed about with columns. And so that could be represented, in fact, as as a sequence of upper triangular matrices. And so this uh, matrix R here uh, is actually, well, it's actually the... Um, the column operations required to re-scramble your orthonormal basis back into the original basis. Or thinking of it another way, our inverse would be the set of column operations required to execute the Gram-Schmidt procedure. Yeah. So if you're familiar with the Gram-Schmidt procedure, that's all QR decomposition is. It's just Gram-Schmidt. You're taking a basis and making it orthonormal. So that's another nice way of thinking about what this represents.
However, from our perspective, uh, we want to use it to solve uh, statistical computing problems, and it just so happens that it perfectly uh, solves our uh, least squares problem. So again, we start with our normal equations, x transpose x in versus x transpose y. We substitute in with qr, and we use the fact that q transpose q is the identity, uh, and, and obviously r times r inverse is the identity, and we end up with this situation here, where we take our y, we rotate it with q, and then we solve a linear system with r. Okay, so we don't actually compute our inverse and, and multiply and pre-multiply it. We actually just solve a linear system for the result. Okay, so we solve the linear system R beta is Q transpose Y um, for beta. And that system is triangular because R is triangular. And so we've seen that we can do that. Uh, if it's upper triangular, it'd be a back substitution. So we just directly solve that with back substitution, which is almost as easy as doing a matrix multiplication. So it's a very, very simple procedure. And so this actually gives us a much uh, more efficient way of solving the least squares problem than even using the SVD. So the SVD is, is just as numerically stable. Um, but the QR factorization is uh, much more uh, computationally efficient. And so that is what um, uh, LM uses. Right? So LM solves this least squares problem using this QR factorization in exactly this way. Uh, and again, we can see that this clearly only depends on the condition number of x. So nowhere are we forming x transpose x and inverting it, yeah? So this is this is a, a just a much better condition problem, and so that's why it worked on that version of the problem where uh, trying to mess about directly with x transpose x failed. But again, it's not perfect, and again, you can break it eventually, uh, just, just as we saw. So you, you can always break these methods, um, but but these more stable versions based on these uh, these very stable matrix decompositions give us a much more reliable way of solving these sorts of problems. Yeah, so I think I've said most of this already. And, and as we've discussed that, you know, we saw that preconditioning trick um, for, you know, trying to make X transpose X a bit better conditioned, but nearly always it's better just to change your problem in the first place to make it so it's better conditioned, right? So there are lots of things we, we could have done with X. We could have centered it. We could have subtracted the mean. We could have used orthogonal polynomials rather than just throwing in the squared term separately, right? There are lots of things we could do to make that problem better conditioned in the first place. And then none of these problems problems ever would have arisen. Yeah, the other thing worth knowing is that we looked at the Cholesky decomposition. Remember, the Cholesky decomposition was um, of the form R transpose R, where R is upper triangular. But if you think about it, if X is QR, then X transpose X is R transpose R. So in fact, uh, when you do a QR decomposition of X, what you're effectively getting for free is the Cholesky decomposition of X transpose X. So again, if you really felt you needed the Cholesky decomposition of X transpose X, rather than first forming X transpose X and then doing a Cholesky decomposition, it's much better and more numerically stable to form the QR factorization of X, and then the R you get is the Cholesky triangle essentially. Now, there is a slight complication in that the most QR routines won't actually bother ensuring that the diagonal elements of R are positive. If you bothered about that, you just flip the signs of the relevant rows. Yeah, so if you've got a negative value on the diagonal, you just flip the sign of that row. That doesn't change anything. Um, so you can easily fix the sign problem if you need to. Actually, typically, you don't need to. It's not typically an issue. Um, so, yeah, it, it, for example, if you really wanted the Cholesky decomposition of a covariance matrix formed as X transpose X, you can you can easily get that directly from the QR factorization of X. You never actually have to form the covariance matrix at all. And that that's a very useful thing to know. And again, we can get determinants from the QR factorization. In the square case, obviously it doesn't make sense if uh, A isn't square, but if A is square, then again, we can use the same idea as before that um, the orthogonal matrices have a determinant of one, so it's just the determinant of R, but R is upper triangular, so the determinant of that is just the product of the diagonal elements. So again, we can very cheaply get a determinant of a matrix from a QR factorization. <laughs> 
So one last thing I wanted to mention before we left the topic of matrix computation was a really useful uh, idea, uh, formula for messing about with inverses of matrices. It goes via various names, but we, we'll just say Woodbury's formula for now. So obviously, matrix algebra is a huge topic, and, and that isn't really the focus of this course. Um, I just want to point you at a, a really uh, amazing document called The Matrix Cookbook. It's just a free PDF available online, uh, maintained by you know some volunteers. Uh, it's an amazing source of uh, information, knowledge, wisdom, identities for messing around with matrices. I use it all the time. Uh, it, it's well worth knowing about. So, you know, take a look at that, have a have a flick through it and see the kinds of things that it, it covers. But it's, it's the kind of thing that if you're doing much matrix algebra, um, it will doubtless come in very handy. Um, so there's all kinds of things you can do with matrices are all kinds of tricks and identities and properties that you can use. Um, but there's one that's like super useful in statistical applications that crops up again and again. And so that's this Woodbury's formula. So what is it and why is it useful? Well, the context is you've got a big matrix. OK, so an M by M matrix where M is reasonably large and maybe it's inverse as well. OK, or maybe you've only got the inverse whatever okay but we've got this this matrix a and it's inverse um we we know a inverse but now we're going to make some change to a and it's going to be a simple low rank update that is we're going to add on to it uv transpose where u and v are both um thin matrices right so um this is going to be a low rank update of a um, so this might be, you know, building a covariance matrix sequentially by adding a new observation, for example, right? But um, the, the point is, it's going to be a low rank update of A. And the question is, can we figure out what the inverse of this updated matrix is in an efficient way without building the new A and then inverting it from scratch all over again, right? Because if this is a big matrix, we're going to prefer not to do that. And the answer is yes, we can. And, and Woodbury's formula gives the answer. So if we're interested in the inverse of A plus UV transpose, uh, there's this amazing identity that says, well, yeah, you just start with A inverse and you modify it in a particular way. And it's not, you know, particularly simple. But the crucial thing to notice is that it doesn't involve any large inverses that you don't already know. So it obviously involves A inverse, but we're assuming we already know the original A inverse, but there are no other N by N inverses involved, right? The only thing we have to invert is this thing in the, the parentheses here, but this is just an N by N matrix, and we're assuming that N is a small number, okay, because we're assuming a low rank update. So we have to invert this thing here, but this thing is only N by N, whereas the thing that we're interested in is M by M, which is much bigger. So the point is that Woodbury's formula allows us to do this update of this M by M matrix, which is huge, by only having to compute an N by N matrix, which is the inverse of an M by N matrix, which is small. Okay, And that's why it's a useful thing. Uh, and this kind of updating structure occurs all the time. So the, the obvious statistical application would be you've got a, a covariance matrix and a precision matrix. You make a modification of your covariance matrix and you want to know how your precision matrix is modified in response. Yeah, that would be a typical example. There are lots of others, but that that's kind of the canonical example in statistics. Um, so that's amazing. So why is it true? Well, you know, there are lots of ways to see why it's true, but the easiest is just to multiply it out. Yeah, so you just multiply that thing on the right hand side by A plus UV transpose on, say, the left, multiply it out, it simplifies to the identity, do it on the right, multiply it out, simplify it, it simplifies down to the identity. So it's a nice little exercise in matrix algebra that you can you can have a go at. Uh, it, it just works. I mean, there are reasons to to understand where it's where it comes from, but you can just check that it's true just by direct multiplication. Okay, so I've said most of that. Um, so there, there are a couple of generalizations and special cases that crop up a lot. So one generalization is it doesn't have to be just UV transpose. You can also have a matrix C, a little N by N matrix C in between them. Uh, that doesn't really change anything. It just gives you a slightly different formula involving a C. 
And again, you can prove it in the same way. Uh, so that one is usually the sort of most general case that's presented that often goes by the name of the Sherman Morrison Woodbury formula. Um, so again, that's just a slight generalization. Actually, a special case crops up very, very often, and that sometimes goes just by the name of the Sherman Morrison formula. Uh, and that says, well, if u and v are just vectors. So again, this is very much the, the canonical case that we were talking about, where you have a covariance matrix and a precision matrix, you get one more observation. Uh, adding that into the covariance matrix corresponds to a rank one update. Uh, and so that rank one update of the, the corresponding rank one update of the precision matrix can be calculated using this formula. So we've got our A inverse. We want to know the inverse of the modified A, and it's given by simply modifying A inverse with this term here. And the nice thing about this is there, there are now, it's now obvious that there are no inversions involved at all because the, the only inversion was of a one by one. So that's how we've ended up with this term on the bottom here. Uh, so this is just um, a very, very simple um, rank one update of A inverse. Yeah, so we modify A with a rank one update and we get a very simple uh, rank one update of A inverse. Okay, so that we'll see in fact, applications of this later in the in the course but I, I think it's worth putting it here with the matrix computation material because it's just such a uh, kind of widely used trick in matrix computations in statistics that it's definitely worth kind of presenting it in generality first and we'll see some applications of it later okay okay so that's really all I wanted to say about matrix computations, I mean, hopefully you've got the uh, idea that this is a huge topic and we you know we've barely scratched the surface here, but uh, at least I hope I've given you a few pointers on what are the key ideas. Okay, so the key ideas are um, don't just do things in a naive way. Don't just take a, a, an algebraic matrix expression and turn it into code without thinking about it. Um, there are lots of issues that can happen with the numerics. It's worth spending some time and effort thinking about those issues. Uh, matrix decomposition, such as Cholesky, uh, SVD, and QR, crop up and are very useful in many statistical applications. Um, the symmetric eigen decomposition can also be useful, but uh, people tend to overuse it, I think, right? Because it's something that people are familiar with from their undergraduate education. They use it in situations where actually a different decomposition might be more appropriate. So yes, have the, the symmetric eigen decomposition as part of your toolkit, um, but do be aware that there are other decompositions that may well be more appropriate in many cases. Uh, in terms of further reading, uh, Goldman Van Loan's book, Matrix Computations, is like the standard reference. It's particularly useful if you're um, working closely with um, BLAS and LAPAC functions. So in particular, if you're directly calling BLAS and LAPAC functions, you are definitely going to want a copy of this book. Uh, it's not the easiest introduction, but um, it's very good. And, you know, it is accessible. Um, there are lots of other books here uh, that you can take a look at. Uh, the GNU Scientific Library is a great source of C code. So if you're a C programmer and you want C code, then probably you should just be calling the routines in the GSL. But even if you're not, it's a good sort of uh, source of very good algorithms. Um, what else? Yeah, the only other thing, we've talked more about uh, how to do matrix computations rather than sort of matrix algebra and its use in statistics. So this book by Harville, I think, is a nice book on the more general topic of matrix algebra and its applications to statistics, as opposed to how do we actually do matrix computations on a computer, which is what we've concentrated on here. Okay, so that's all for matrix computations. Thanks.